Great, we're good. So I see a few people who I already know in the crowd. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I am Calvin Hedler. Uh, this is my talk, so you want to be a pen tester. Um, the idea of this is to give you guys kind of the information that I wish I had before I started this job uh, and before I got into actual security work about a year ago. So I've been doing this for around a year. Um, first, a little bit about me. My Twitter handle is at 001Spartan. If you guys use Twitter, I use it infrequently. Um, I am a junior pen tester for a company called Networks Group right in downtown Ann Arbor. And I'm a speed skater. I strap metal blades to my feet and go 25 miles an hour around an ice rink. Uh, if you want to know what it's like to hit the wall head first at 25 miles an hour, um, it's a little bit painful. I was sore for a couple of days after that. And I am a student at EMU in the Information Assurance Program. I'm a super duper senior now. Um, hopefully I'll get out of there soon enough. Uh, that's pretty much it about me. Uh, so like I said, uh, this talk is about my experiences over the past year of doing pen testing. Um, I want to help you guys learn from my mistakes, uh, things to do, things not to do. Uh, and then I'll go over a little bit of a case study about uh, the process that I went through on a couple of pen tests recently this year. So first off, uh, what should you do? Um, or what are things that you need to do in order to be a good pen tester and in order to be prepared for your first engagement? First off, you need to prepare your gear. Then, of course, you need to know your tools. You need to know what it is you're using. You need to know when you will use certain tools, how they react, that sort of thing. You always need to have a plan because even if the plan gets completely messed up by something that happens, uh, you need to know at what point you're going to do certain things in the engagement. And then you need to be able to find the goodies, and I'll go over what that means more later. So the first step, of course, when you're going on an engagement the night before sometimes, uh, is to prepare your gear. And as pen testers, we have a lot of different stuff. We've got laptops, we've got rubber duckies, we've got flash drives, all kind of chargers. Um, I probably have about a dozen chargers whenever I go somewhere. Um, all right in my backpack, and you need to make sure you have all that because when you're on an engagement sitting there in an office or trying to break in and you realize suddenly that you don't have an Ethernet cable, <laughs> that is not a good thing. So you always need to make sure you know what you have, and you always need to make sure that you have it ahead of time. After that, you need to know your tools. Uh, who recognizes what this is on the screen here? It's Nmap, right? Pretty standard tool. Um, probably most of you know it already, but as pen testers, we use a ton of tools. We use everything from scanning tools to attack tools to recon tools. I'm pretty sure that on a given engagement, I will use over two dozen tools, whether they're custom or pre-made, open source, closed source, all sorts of things. And you need to know all of them. You need to know what they do. You need to know how they accomplish that. You need to know how they fail. And you need to know how they can be caught. Up on the screen here, I have Metasploit's PSExec, and it is not working. And something that will cause it to not work is UAC being above medium security level. That kind of knowledge is important because if something is failing on a pen test, you need to be able to diagnose that, and you need to be able to respond accordingly. Another thing that you would want to know about PSExec is that it spawns a service and that it leaves a very noticeable event in the system logs that blue team people can look for. You need to be aware of that so that you can adjust your techniques accordingly or so that you can be prepared to be caught or not get caught as the case may be. Throwing around tools blindly is a good way to get caught and or break systems. So neither of those is a good thing when you're a pen tester. Secondly, you need to plan ahead. You need to know what your objectives are. What will you try to accomplish in the engagement? How will you do that? What are the techniques you're going to use? What are the tools you're going to use? Do you have a backup plan in case you can't do something right the first time? And when? How long are you going to spend on something before you give up and say, okay, I'll move on to the next objective? 
uh, at what point in the engagement are you going to perform certain attacks or try to get at certain data. All that sort of stuff is very critical because if you don't have a good plan, then you're just going to be floundering and you don't want to be sitting there in the middle of the client's office being like, uh, so what now? And that won't get you any bonus points. That won't get you what you need as a pen tester. And lastly, uh, not lastly, second to last, you need to find the goodies. What does that mean? You need to ask yourself a couple different questions before you start the engagement. You need to ask, what does the client do? What's their business? What are they trying to keep safe? Do they have credit card numbers? Are they worried about PCI? Are they worried about HIPAA? Do they have social security numbers? What sort of data do they deal with? If they're a manufacturing company, they're probably concerned about keeping their manufacturing plants going. If they're a power company, they want to keep the lights on, that sort of thing. You need to find out what they're afraid of happening and figure out how an attacker would do that. And you can even straight up ask them. You can say, what are you concerned about? That will very often get you a good idea of if they're doing this sort of threat modeling that they need, if they're conscious of the risks and they're, they know what to watch out for. And that question is very important because it can show a disconnect or it can show you, here's what we're worried about, here's what you should go for on the pen test. For example, if they're a company that's worried about PCI compliance and you're doing a pen test for them, have they been breached before? Did they lose credit card data? If so, they probably want to check to make sure that they don't still have plain text credit cards sitting on a secretary's computer. They probably want to make sure that they aren't keeping millions of uh, transactions in a database that's unsecured, stuff like that. You need to know what they're concerned about so that you can check for it. And then, of course, what not to do. Uh, many people fall into these traps. I won't say that I haven't before. Um, but you need to make sure that you are not getting cocky, damaging systems, creating vulnerabilities, or getting caught. The last one is sometimes optional depending on the gig. But first off, don't get cocky. You're not there to look cool. You're not there to have fun. You're there to do a job. If you do your job properly, the first two will probably come along with that. You will look cool, you'll get to do some really cool shit, and you're going to get to do some fun stuff at the same time. But those are not your primary job as a pen tester. Sure, it's cool being able to break into a building and gain access to their domain controllers and dump password hashes and stuff like that, but so what? So you got domain admin. You need to answer that question. So what? Why does it matter? You need to show them where their security issues are, and you need to make sure that you're explaining that in a way that it's not about you. You're serving their needs, it's not the other way around. Don't break things. Of course, as pen testers, our job is to break things, uh, but you need to be careful about doing that. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not crashing production systems. When you dump 50,000 uh, password hashes on a domain controller, sometimes it'll fill up the RAM and crash. Uh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to alter data. If you're looking at their credit card transaction log, you don't want to change those transactions to, uh, you know, affect actual business processes. You're there to show that you could, but you don't want to actually do that. That's how you wind up with talking to lawyers, and that's not fun. Don't change settings. This is not critical in some cases. Sometimes you will need to change certain settings to be able to get uh, proper penetration. But you don't want to change settings to make things more insecure. And that's kind of going into my next point. Don't create insecurity. You're there to test insecurity. You're not there to create it. If you see a vulnerability and exploit it, that's fine. If you specifically open up a vulnerability in a system, like say you just spawn a bind shell on a web server, that's probably not a good idea because then anybody else on the internet could connect to that and have the same amount of control that you do. Our job is to do testing in a safe way and to demonstrate things in a way that won't allow another attacker to get in. 
off the back of what you're doing. And sometimes that can happen. Yeah? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, it depends on the engagement, of course, but um, we'll use tactics like that if they're necessary. Uh, and sometimes creating vulnerabilities like that is kind of uh, is necessary. But you want to do it in the safest possible way. You want it to be as controlled as possible. If you're just leaking out data over pastebin to perform data exfiltration, that's not a good thing. You need to find ways that w will expose your client as little as possible while, you while you're doing the engagement. Don't get caught. Like I said, this, this one is optional depending on the sort of engagement that you're doing. But in order to not get caught, you need to know uh, a couple different things. You need to know what tools are going to be noisy. You need to know what tools are going to trigger alarms. You need to know how much bail will be if you get arrested while you're breaking into a building. <laughs> Although, hopefully that won't happen. So, you need to be conscious of these things if you're trying to stay hidden. If you create a domain administrator, that's probably going to trigger every single alarm they have. They're going to wake up their sysadmins in the middle of the night and say, hey, something's going on, uh, let's press the panic button. There are quieter ways to do things. If you're going around blindly throwing T5 Nmap scans at, you know, as fast as you can, as fast as you can, something's probably going to detect that and you need to be aware of that. There are ways to be stealthy and you want to make use of you want to make use of those as much as you can. And then, of course, you don't want to get arrested. Uh, usually we have a get-out-of-jail-free card, but uh, <laughs> even so, you don't want to get caught by the police because that's just no fun. So far, I've managed to avoid that, but this is always the first time. So uh, in order to demonstrate that, uh, these techniques, uh, what I've learned over the past year or so, um, I'm going to go through some case studies about uh, engagements that I've been on. What I did, what mistakes I made, that sort of thing. And I'm fairly new, so there were mistakes made on these engagements. Um, there were times when I didn't follow my own advice, and I want to help you guys, if you're getting into pen testing, to not fall into the same trap as I did. So, the first case study was a large retailer. 50,000 plus employees, uh, $10 billion in revenue every year, and six character passwords. So I'm going to walk you through the various phases of this engagement. Of course, first we start out externally. We enumerated applications. We found their, um, their IPs, their uh, various blocks that they controlled, all their external facing web applications. Um, we scan those IPs for various services to see what's going on there. And then we identified entry points. That's basically anywhere a user can log into the system. It could be VPN. It could be Outlook. It could be uh, SMTP, SSH, all sorts of things. You need to examine each one of those. In this case, we determined that one of those applications was not locking out user accounts no matter how many tries we uh, threw at it. So, based on this web application, we did a reverse brute force. And what that does, instead of picking a ton of usernames, a ton of passwords, trying them all against each other, uh, you know, millions of times until you find a match, we chose one password. And we chose a thousand different usernames that we could find for this client. And we found out that the password was the season and the year. So if your password for anything is summer 16 right now, change it. Right now, I will wait if you have that password. <laughs> yes. So we did that. We brute forced the entry point that we found, which was, I believe it was a VPN client login. So we found a valid username. We found a valid password summer 2016. And then we logged into their VPN. We had a foothold. We were basically internal to their network at that time. 
Had we realized it then, we probably could have gotten domain admin from the outside. But this was getting towards the end of the week before we went on site, so we ran out of time. We got access to a user's workstation. Uh, we tried a, a couple different things to uh, gain some gain a foothold inside their network. Uh, we didn't realize quite where we were inside their network, so we didn't get the access that we would have liked to. But we ran out of time. And that'll happen. But you just need to roll with it. You need to have a plan. You need to know what's next. So we went on site to do the internal phase. How many people here are familiar with a tool called Responder? A few people. So for those of you who don't know, what Responder does is it will listen for NBTNS requests and LLMNR requests. And those are Windows computers being very helpful and screaming out to the network, hey, does anybody know where ASDF.com is? If it doesn't have it in the local cache, it'll then start asking the network. If somebody types a domain name wrong, that won't resolve. Normally, that will never get a reply. But Responder, very helpfully on your attacker workstation, will say, yes, I do know where ASDF.com is. That's me. Give me your username and your password. It's very helpful. Windows makes life very easy for us. Responder will almost always get us a valid uh, username and password. And there are plenty of trivial ways to disable that behavior. But not enough people do it. Not enough people know that that exists. And that's why we do what we do as pen testers, to show people this is what you should be aware of. This is something that you should look out for, for a real attacker to do. So we got a valid username and password. While we were doing this, we were enumerating. We were scanning using things like NBT scan, using ping sweeps, using Nmap all sorts of different techniques to get as much information about the network as we could. We looked for domain controllers, we looked for file shares, we looked for important workstations, like if something says CEO workstation, probably important. Luckily, we didn't really need to do much more to get domain admin because Responder got us a username and password. It was for a domain administrator account and the password was six characters. That cracked in about half a minute. It doesn't take very long if you have weak passwords. And that was the entire, uh, that was the whole reason that we got domain admin, is one weak password. It only takes that much. If you don't disable uh, LLMNR or NBTNS, things like that, you're going to be vulnerable to that. And that's what your job is to show. You have these legacy accounts. They have default passwords or very, very weak passwords. They haven't been used in eight years, nine years, or something like that. But an attacker doesn't care about that. An attacker is going to take the quickest way in he can. And we did. Six-character password. Now what's next? Like I said, we have to find the trophy data. In this case, this was a retailer. They had credit cards. They had a pharmacy. So they had PHI, healthcare information. They had private uh, privately identifiable information, social security numbers, addresses, link to real names, all that sort of stuff. They had it. We needed to look for it. The quickest way to get that is to attack certain high value targets. Those are going to be network shares, those are going to be executives, um, account managers, all that sort of stuff. You need to know who to look for and what where you're likely to find the data. And that's where enumeration really comes in handy. If you don't do that proper enumeration, if you don't do that reconnaissance, you won't be able to find that as easily, and you're just going to be you know, spinning your wheels trying to look for this stuff over a week or more and not going to get anywhere. So we tried to gather more credentials for uh, various applications that they had. We logged into their switches. We um, saw their mainframes. We decided not to log into those. Uh, but we did get cr credentials for them because they're concerned about that. Their servers are handling, you know, thousands of credit card transactions a minute. We showed them that as an attacker, with this level of access, we could gain access to that. It didn't take anything more than cracking a six-character password. And that's something that a Nessus scan will never show you. That's why pen testing is more than just running a Nessus scan giving them a 5,000-page report and saying, we're done. We never used Nessus a single time on this. 
And then, after we did all this, after we gathered information, after we showed that we could get credit card information or control their entire domain, we decided to test their security team. For responses, we decided to try and be as noisy as we could to see what the detection threshold was. We ran louder scans. We did some really sketchy activity on their network. They didn't see it. So we created a, a domain administrator. We were logged into one of their security guys' box, uh, e inboxes, so we deleted the email that alerted, hey, somebody's just made a domain administrator. Nobody noticed. The next day, we still had that domain administrator there. Nobody had noticed that a new domain administrator had been created. There was one email. No text messages, no phone calls in the middle of the night, no bright red flashing lights in the data center, nothing. And we could do whatever we wanted to. We created another domain administrator. We waited. No response. We were sitting down in the little room that they put us in. We had two domain administrators. We were doing whatever we wanted to on their network. Still nothing. That was a little bit weird because, you know, we didn't delete an email. We didn't try to disrupt their security team at all. They still didn't notice. We had to create three domain administrators for anybody to take notice, and then it took them about two hours to track us down and find where we were. That's exactly the sort of thing you want to do when you're testing a response. Um, a lot of people are emphasizing the idea of hacking to get caught now. Hacking to show the defenders what to do, what to look out for. And that's something that I think we should absolutely be doing as uh, pen testers, because if we're not actively helping make the defenders better, we're not doing our job well enough. So we tested their security team. And then after that, they were concerned about physical security, which is just fun to do because, you know, you get to break into buildings and climb over fences and do all sorts of fun stuff. So we did a little bit of physical security. Uh, a common tactic is to tailgate through doors. Somebody will hold the door open for you because people are very helpful. If you have a box in your hands, there's nobody who's not going to get the door for you and say, here, let me hold that. And thank you very much. Now I'm in. Oh, you're going to scan your badge for me and put in your pin to get through the second door. That's even more helpful. Thank you. My badge is just in my pocket, I swear. So, that sort of thing, uh, gaining access to the building, it's important because they're obviously concerned about somebody coming in and ransacking the place or um, gaining access to their systems physically because everybody knows that physical access is root. We jumped over turnstiles uh, because, you know, they had little turnstile things for all the employees to scan into. And you know, if you were doing it properly, you scan your badge in, you walk through the turnstile, it counts that this badge has been scanned. You jump over it, nobody notices. They had security cameras, but nobody was watching them. What good are those security cameras if you don't have somebody watching to say, hey, that person just jumped over the turnstile. Maybe we should send somebody down to investigate. We broke into their data center uh, using an under, under door tool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, any sort of the lever type door handles, um, we have a tool that will go under the door, come up, grab the handle, and you just open it from the inside because those all unlock when you open them from the inside. Uh, I think it's an OSHA requirement. Um, and it takes all of 10 seconds at most if you do it uh, properly. This one took us a little bit longer, um, but nobody stopped us to question us. Why were we doing this to the data center doors? They have, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars of equipment in there. Yeah? Yeah, if you have automatic doors, that's an even better way to do it. Um, in this case, data center didn't have automatic doors, but it did have a little gap under the door. And nobody seemed to know that if there's a little gap under the door, there are there's a tool that's 30 bucks, and you can buy it online and have it shipped to your house in next day shipping. So it 
And you can even make one out of a bit of coat hanger and a string, practically. It's not hard to do, but nobody's watching out for. And that's exactly our job as pen testers, to show that people are not realizing the vulnerabilities that they have, even if they're easily exploitable. Nope, you gotta be able to think outside the box. Think like an attacker, because that's where our value is. And then we were just generally noisy, uh, nosy. We poked around in the offices, we walked around, you know, checking computers to see if they were unlocked. Uh, we checked for papers left out on the desk. We s took pictures of a couple sticky notes with passwords on them because everybody likes to do that. You know, you flip over the keyboard, hey, password one, okay. If somebody did manage to tailgate in, they would have access to that information. We didn't have employee badges, we didn't um, have any sort of ID, we just walked around their offices, and it's so big, nobody questions you if you don't have a badge. Once you're on the inside, people trust you. You should be there, right? You can walk around no matter what. If you look like you know where you're going, nobody's going to stop you and say, hey, where's your badge? People don't want to do that. People don't want to confront you because we don't like confrontation. I don't want to stop you and make your uh, stick my nose in your business. Maybe you forgot your badge at your desk. That's what you have to rely on when you're doing this sort of physical security. And then we tested another location. Um, this was a type of a um, a type of distribution facility. And in order to get through this, all we had to do was walk through the snow for about a mile and a half. And I wore ankle socks and sneakers because I was not expecting to go through the snow. <laughs> uh, yes, my ankles were very cold after that. Um, I'm lucky I didn't get frostbite. And we slipped under a fence. There was a gap there, so we slipped under the fence. We got in, we walked around. Everybody else had hard hats, safety vests, things like that, employee badges. We were just two guys in jeans and coats. Nobody said anything. We walked past people, and they said, Hey, how's it going? Nobody questioned us. That's what, the, that's what you want to demonstrate to your client. You want to show nobody's asking questions. Nobody's taking security as their, a priority. Here's what you can do to improve that. And we avoided arrest. Uh, there were, um, at a different location, uh, we tried to break in and we were stopped. Then we decided to try again. We were told by our point of contact that there are cops waiting for you if you try and do that again. Probably a good idea to call it off at this point. So uh, I've almost been arrested. I have not been arrested. I would like to stay out of handcuffs for as long as possible. And I would like to not go to jail. And that's always important as pen testers. Uh, it can happen when you're doing the sort of physical security assessments that uh, some of us may do. Um, yeah, try not to get arrested. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Uh, yes, we do have get out of jail free letters, which are basically a piece of paper from the client that says these people are authorized to do this kind of work. Um, yeah. Yep, exactly. So you have this letter. Uh, sometimes it will make a difference, sometimes it won't, and there will be, you know, lots of phone calls and you'll sit in a jail cell. Uh, I have no desire to experience that. Um, so, we're... Yep. Uh, that, uh, I mean, it, it has its perks, but I, I still wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely something to watch out for. You don't want to get arrested. I don't want to go to jail. So, you know, be as careful as you can. Always have that um, letter of permission saying you are allowed to be here. You are allowed to be doing what you're doing. A business card will definitely help to prove that you are who you say you are, uh, because you know business cards can't be faked or whatever. Um, but generally, 
Um, if you are sneaky enough and you keep your wits about you, that won't happen. Uh, I've only been do doing this for a year. There are probably people who have been doing this for longer than I have who have been in that position. Um, but that's just my experience so far. And now I will move on to a very different case study. Uh, this is a very clear example, the best that I've seen so far, of pen testing actually making a difference, actually bringing people um, to improve their security, to raise awareness, and to, you know, it's the example of pen testers doing their jobs properly, showing the client the risks, and then explaining that in a way that allows the client to make adjustments. This is a small business. They have one location, one office, 100 employees, and they're concerned about PCI primarily when they first contacted us. So we did a pen test. In year one, there was SQL injection in external applications. It lets you read the customer database, add social security numbers, credit card information, all that fun stuff. All exposed on the internet to somebody who can run SQL map. And that is pretty much everybody and my dog. Uh, it's not very hard to do, and I'm sure most people here are aware of that. Internally, they had things like MSO8067, default passwords, uh, and that's pretty much it. You get 10,000 plus records with PHI, PII, credit card numbers. Uh, my slide is broken. Um, but that was pretty much game over. We got the goodies. This was not me personally, but this was my company. Uh, and this was the first time they'd ever had a pen test done. And we wrecked them, of course, because they weren't taking security seriously. They had Windows XP, they had Windows 2003, they had Windows 2000, all that sort of stuff. But then they asked us to come back next year. Next year, we didn't get anywhere. They had all their web applications behind a WAF, even though they were still probably not fixed, uh, at least prevented us from getting anywhere. Um, it, you know, blocked us at every turn. Uh, internally, they had fully patched Windows 7 and 8. And they had 15 character passwords. How many of you have a 15 character password? More, more than half, I would say. But still, 15 character passwords in an enterprise environment. They changed them monthly, too. Even if you could crack the 15 character passwords, it would probably take longer than a month, so then it would be a different password. Even if people are using common patterns, it's still going to be a pain in the ass to crack any of those passwords. We didn't end up cracking any of the passwords in the week that we had to do the engagement. So we failed. And that's a good thing. We want to go into environments and say, we didn't get access. We use this, we use sneaky tactics. Yeah. Uh, so, in many cases, that is a valid tactic. That's something an attacker would do. But generally speaking, we're not allowed to perform denial of service attacks on our engagement because customers don't like things going down, even if it's a WAF that is out in the cloud somewhere. Unfor yep, exactly. Yep. Exactly. And that's a very valid point. In this engagement, we weren't able to test that. Um, we would have liked to, obviously. We, we like these engagements where everything is in scope, no holds barred, we're allowed to do whatever we want. But the reality is that's not always an option. Clients want you to do certain things. Clients want you to not touch certain servers, things like that. They say, don't touch our file share. It'll go down if you even look at it wrong. Well, it's your file share. Isn't that important? Don't you want that tested? Yeah, but it'll go down if you look at it wrong. So don't test it. Stay away from it. Stay away from our domain controller, too, while you're at it. Come on. So you have to try to convince them to let you do everything. But that's not always going to happen. Sometimes your hands are going to be tied. In this case, our hands were somewhat... Yep. 
That's a very, I mean, that will convince some people, that won't convince other people. Um, it's a good, it's a very good question whenever we're being limited to things that we feel, uh, like a scope is too narrow or something like that, we ask that question. Um, but a lot of the time we're dealing with people who don't have the authority to let us do more, unfortunately. And obviously as pen testers it's more fun to do full scope, anything goes pen testing, but sometimes that's not an option. But in this case we failed. And we failed because we had done the pen test before and we tore them apart. They were terrified of what would happen. And with a smaller organization, they had the ability to make those huge changes in just a year because the IT manager said, we're doing this, and that's what they were doing. It's not going to happen in larger organizations, but I think this is a really good example of how we as pen testers should work with the defenders. We should help them improve. We should give them all the ammunition that we can in order to improve their organization's security. The more things that you find for your clients, the more ammunition they have to take to management and say, we're going to be fucked if someone even looks at us. Let's make some changes. And our job as pen testers is to do that. We need to show them that there are things you can do to prevent this from happening. And look how easy it is for us to get in an attacker is going to do the same things. That's why pen testing, I feel, is very important. And that's a great example of how we can make a difference. A lot of people um, view pen testing as go in, break shit, give them a 500-page Nessus report, say, we're out, we're done, have, have fun, good luck. But you need to work with them. Your job as a pen tester isn't all offensive as much as we would like it to be. We have to do more, we have to be better than those, you know, big four shops who are just delivering 500 page Nessus reports run by an intern. That's not your job as a pen tester. You need to do more. And you need to push the client to let you do more in order to demonstrate that. So, um, I guess I still have some time. I ran through that a little bit quick. Uh, if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to discuss things with me, I'm happy to take any sort of comments or criticisms. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ah, that is a good example of something I forgot to leave, uh, forgot to put in my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, let me see. One of the things I learned is to not hash dump a domain controller when you've got, you know, tens of thousands of users <laughs> and you don't know what your tool is going to do. Um, that was on that retailer engagement. Uh, we tried to do a hash dump on a domain controller. Um, it stopped responding. Nobody complained specifically, but uh, we were not aware that it would behave like that. And we made a specific note to not do that in the future. Um, another thing is that uh, pen testing is more than just running scans. It's more than just looking cool. It's about actually helping people improve security. When you're getting into pen testing, you want to get shells. You want to get root. You want to break in. You want to show people how cool you are. But at the same time, I've seen that it's better to be humble. It's better to come to them as not an adversary but as someone who is there to help. You're there to do your job. You're there to assist your client. You're not there to look cool. You can have fun doing it. You can look cool while you're doing it. But that's not your primary goal, and it shouldn't be. And I think that's something that I wish uh, more red team talks emphasized. And then I guess the importance of uh, being caught sometimes. Um, how being caught can be a good thing because it can be a learning experience for both you and the defenders. Um, because if they see something, they can then go down the rabbit hole. They can see, they can dig deeper into the event and figure out what they would actually do if they had an incident and they needed to respond to it. So getting, hacking to get caught is a big thing that, um, 
I would like to do more of and that I've learned about over the past year. Yeah. Uh, I would say basically no hold barred. Let us attack your organization completely. Don't give us a scope. Let us find you. Let us do like three months of work to get in from the outside. Um, you know, let us use tactics like getting hired at the company. Let us do things like fish your users. We do that in many cases, but sometimes they're like, oh, we don't want to test that because our users will click anything. They're stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That That's the sort of thing we want to do because those are real world things. Like, you're not going to have an attacker say, oh, these servers look fragile. I won't touch those because they're fragile. And that and that's what we would do if given our, you know, our way. Yeah. The other side of that common mode is that sometimes you already know your users. So that's a known issue. When I hire a tester, I want to know who's that. Yeah, and that's entirely fair, and that's a valid point. Um I think that uh as pen testers we need to realize that it's not just about getting domain admin. It's what you can do after that to demonstrate, okay, we know that you can get domain admin. Now what? What's the end game? And that's where getting the goodies comes into play. But to get back to your original question, yeah, there are perfectly valid reasons to not want us to do things. But as attackers, we're not going to say, oh, that's unfair. That's cheating. A, a, kid sitting in his basement in Russia is not going to say, uh, well, I, I think it would be unfair if I fished them because I'm too good at fishing. It, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yep. Yep, absolutely. We don't just give them a giant list of vulnerabilities. We say, here's, measure, here's measures you can take to prevent this. Here are best practices for how to deal with this. We aren't just going in there, breaking stuff, and saying, here's what we broke, good luck. We're saying, here's specific things you can do to correct that, to train your users, to patch this, to um, raise awareness about this issue. We try and do, we try and give them defensive tips after we go in and break everything. Yeah, if there was an active incident going on, we would absolutely drop everything, say you have this going on, take a look at this, and we'll help with that however possible. Uh, so, I am a student at EMU in the IA program. I will say that most of what I learned about attacking systems, about doing pen testing, was not from school. Uh, it was tinkering with computers. It was breaking things that, you know, my own wireless router. I broke into it to show that I could and say, hey, this is pretty cool. I can get into things. Um, most of Most of what we do is not taught in school. Uh, you're not going to be taught how to, you know, trick someone into letting you in a building in school. You're not going to be um, taught about lock picking in school most of the time. Uh, I'm not good at lock picking, but that's beside the point. <laughs> so, my educational background, I do go to school for security, um, but it's not enough. You always need to be constantly learning. You need to be pushing yourself to do better. You need to read, you know, InfoSec Twitter to keep up on the latest and greatest news. You need to be digging deeper into topics that interest you at every given point. I read constantly. Um, I read even when I shouldn't be reading because I'm addicted to learning more. I need to push myself to become, you know, as good a pen tester as I can be. So it's mostly on my own time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whenever we come across something that stops us, whenever we uh, fail to do something, we absolutely take a look at that in our lab and say, how can we bypass this? 
are there issues that could arise um, that we didn't have time to discover? Um, of course, you don't always have time to dig into that as deep as you would like, but we absolutely do uh, do that uh, because it's part of becoming better hackers. Yeah, just this, um, just yesterday I came back from an engagement where we had a long time to research a company. We had a couple weeks to start learning about them, to connect with employees on LinkedIn, um, to uh, research as much as possible about them. And we started spear phishing and uh, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, we were unsuccessful, actually, um, because we didn't anticipate some countermeasures that they had. Uh, but, yeah, the um, recon, absolutely, the more the better. Uh, we usually start looking at the client when we first hear that we might get the engagement because the more time we have, the better our pen test will be externally, the more we can fish them, all sorts of stuff. The more time, the better. Anyone else? I don't bite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're worried about the client knowing that the pen test is going on and employees being aware that it's going on and actually. Oh. Well, of course, we try and keep OPSEC as good as possible. And that's, the most you can do, I would say. Um, if you keep it a tight ship and make sure that there are no information leaks on your end, you're doing as much as possible. Um, like, we never mention client names. We would never associate pen test results with uh, the actual client, all that sort of stuff. And we're absolutely concerned with our results getting into the wrong hands, and we do everything to counteract that. Any other questions? I was just going to ask you the back question. What kind of prerequisites do you have to Um. Well, the problem is that a lot of people get into pen testing from widely disparate backgrounds and everything. Uh, I would say definitely knowledge of the sysadmin sort of tasks, common things that you'll need to know, like Active Directory. You need to know Windows because everybody uses Windows. Uh, you need to know Linux because a lot of the tools we use are based on Linux. You need to know um, as much as possible about the internals, uh, the common configurations. And honestly, that's my weak point because I don't have that level of experience. I know a good deal, but I don't have years of experience to draw upon. And we're still able to do fairly well. So as much in, um, prerequisite knowledge, I would say you need to know computers in general. You need to know various operating systems, um, and you need to be competent with all of them. Not You don't have to be a professional with any of them, but you need to at least know your way around. Does that answer your question? Uh, one of the big things driving pen testing is PCI, um, because if you handle credit card data, you need to have pen testing done. I think now it's twice a year um, in 2018. Uh, that's one of the big things that's driving pen testing. So all these companies that want to be uh, PCI compliant need to have pen tests done. So we try to do more than PCI pen tests. We try to convince them, hey, PCI is compliance, but compliance is not security. Security is what we want to test. We don't want to test compliance. We will, but we want to do more in addition to that. Uh, this last engagement that I was on was a PCI assessment that we convinced them to allow us to do full scope. 
meaning we weren't just testing PCI requirements to the letter. We were testing outside of that more what a realistic attacker would do. But companies are looking for pen testers. Companies are looking for um, consulting to do pen tests. Uh, I can't give you a number on market share or anything like that because I don't know that just offhand. But hopefully that answers your question. There is demand. Yeah. Yeah. Penetration testing. Hmm. I, yep, my job title is penetration tester. Sometimes it'll be like security analyst or um, a security consultant. Um, but my job is penetration tester. That's what I have on my business card. Uh, so external tools that we use to identify what a customer is running, right? Um, so we use a lot of different stuff. Of course, there's always Nmap. Uh, Nmap is the go-to tool for recon because it's so widely known. It's yeah. Um, we will do things like using Shodan, uh, Shodan results for the company. Um, for those of you who don't know, Shodan is basically a database of internet connected systems that are being scanned by Shodan uh, for open ports, for services, for applications. So you can very easily identify what a company has externally um, through that. Additionally, you um, can use like CMS mapping tools. You can use uh, things like that. A lot of checking for web applications is just right click view source. Does that answer your question? I, I can, I'm happy to talk more tools, um, if you, yeah, sure, yeah. Any other questions? I think we're just about done here, five minutes or so, yeah. Uh, we use Kali, um, it's, from what I can tell, it's fairly well integrated, all the tools are set up. When it breaks, it's a pain in the ass, but um, it's also a pain to set up from stock Linux. I don't have an opinion one way or the other. This is just what uh, my team decided to use as a group. Um, there are benefits to both, but I would always choose to run some flavor of Linux for a pen test setup. Like, I have, I have my MacBook, but um, maybe I have my MacBook, uh, but I... For pen testing, we do virtualize Kali. You had a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Do you say, so you said you work with a team and a company that's pen testing. Yep. Do they accept uh, internships or anyone wants to learn how to do it? Uh, I would say we're open to the idea. I don't know if we're hiring specifically. Um, I, if you want to give me your contact information, I can ask. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so you need to be creative. Um, it's not a science. It's not uh, something specific. You need to be able to think outside the box. People say that it's cliche, but it's true. Um, you need to think like an attacker does. You need to say, Hey, I'm a bad guy. What do I do? Um, being, having that malicious mindset is important, but at the same time, you need to be very ethical on top of that. You need to be absolutely committed to improving security, I would say, rather than just breaking stuff for the hell of it. I think it's important to realize that we're doing a job, we're doing a very important thing, and we should not, we should do our best to be reasonable and to perform our duties without breaching confidentiality or anything like that. Yeah. One, one tool or something like that? As much of a script kitty as I sound like Metasploit, because it has all those tools, it has 
lots of different stuff. If you learn about Metasploit internals, you can extend it to do whatever you want. Um, and it's a script kitty tool, but it's so much more than that as well. Um, it's absolutely a good tool to learn, as bad a reputation as it has among defenders and among some red team people. It's a great starting point for people getting into pen testing. Am I being cut off? Okay, five more minutes. So any other questions you guys have, I'm happy to answer. If not, thank you for... Yes. Yes, crowd. <laughs>